Christian theologian John Stott has said that cows can moo, dogs bark, donkeys bray, pigs grunt, lambs bleat, lions roar, monkeys squeal, and birds sing. But only human beings can speak. The gift of speech is unique to those who are made in the image of God. And today we're talking about words. Specifically, today, taming the tongue. And if you have a Bible, I hope you'll turn it open to the New Testament book of James as we study today from God's Word. Great to see you in worship. Great to have those of you that are online today. Uh, We love this time. We count it special to have the opportunity to join together around God's book and to let it speak into our lives and to dig deeper into His Word. So James chapter 3 is where we'll be, but I think you would agree with me that uh, these are days where there are a lot of words being spoken. And I guess this chapter and this specific verse or two that we're looking at today would be appropriate any time. But I think it is especially appropriate in the day and time in which we now live. Words are a big part of our daily life. There seems to be no lack of words. People are always talking. There's talk radio. There's political talk. There's sports talk. There's family talk. There's plenty of talk on social media. There is a lot of talk, a lot of chatter in the world today. Just before we look at James chapter 3, let me give you a verse of reference that I think fits right in with what we're trying to understand and learn today. It's from the book of Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21. Maybe you've heard this before. It is a classic verse. Proverbs 18 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. I like the way that Eugene Peterson in the message renders this, kind of in modern language. The message says it this way, words kill and words give life. They're either poison or fruit you choose. So hang on to that as we begin to look at James chapter 3 and specifically verses 3, 4, and 5. That's our beginning point. And we're thinking about, first of all, the power of words. The power of words. So what does James have to say to us about the way we speak, the way we talk, the way we uh, converse with others? This is what James 3 verse 3 says. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by just a small spark. Emily Dickinson, the American poet, said it this way, she said, I know nothing in the world that, is as much, that has as much power as a word. I think James, the New Testament writer, would agree with that. In verses 3, 4, and 5, he gives us these metaphors, these examples, these vivid illustrations of the way that our tongue is small, but it is powerful in its use. He begins by talking about a horse and a bit, A ship and a rudder, a forest fire and a spark. And his point in all three of these illustrations is something very, very small can do something very, very large. And so he begins by talking in verse 3 about the great power of a bit in the mouth of a horse. And we know that to be true. The power of a bit is enormous to control that horse. I was reading about one of the largest horses ever on record. It was a purebred bellion stallion by the name of Brooklyn Supreme. It weighed 3,200 pounds. That's right, 3,200 pounds and was 19.2 hands 
tall. He lived to be 20 years of age and died on a farm in Iowa. But that big, enormous horse was governed and controlled by a two-pound bit in its mouth. So James is making the point that our words, seemingly small, can do large, powerful, impactful things for the good or for the bad. And he begins by this illustration. Then he goes to the illustration of a a ship, and he talks about uh, the way that a large ship is directed at sea by means of just a small rudder. I mean, the rudder compared to the ship in size is relatively small, but that rudder directs and controls and navigates the ship. So our tongue, small as it is, can navigate and do a lot of uh, good or a, a lot of bad. And then in James 3, verse 5, he talks about a spark and a forest fire. And we know this to be especially true in the summer months in our country. Just every year, you can count on it. Uh, There will be forest fires that will rage in the western United States, and they will consume many times acres. And sometimes that fire... That large fire begins by just a little spark. Doesn't take much. A little spark creating an enormous fire that consumes acres upon acres. Well, the point is made through all of these illustrations that words have tremendous power. And let me remind you today in this place or online today, let me just remind us today that our words have the power you know this, the power to bless or to break. Is that not right? The things that we say have the ability to bless someone or to break someone. James, as you think about the entirety of Scripture, is not the only one to talk about the power and uh, influence of our words. The psalmist has a lot to say about words. So if you're making notes, and some of you are, here are a few references in the Psalms that talk about the tongue, the words, the speech that comes from our mouth. Psalm 19, verse 14, I love this one. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May our words be pleasing to God. And then Psalm 34, 1 on this Sunday morning, Psalm 34, 1, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. The psalmist has something to say about words and the way we use them. Psalm 141, verse 3, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Now we can imagine that imagery. God, I need a guard on my mouth. Sometimes I say things I should not say. Lord, guard my lips and the things that I say to others. Pastor, writer John Piper puts it this way. What would the world be like? The home, the church, the school, the public square, if words were used the way that Jesus used them. So I hope you're tracking with me today. We're talking about the power of words and the need to tame our tongue. So I thought we would just write down some words that bless. Since words are powerful and they have the ability to bless others, today, this week, you can bless someone with your words if you so choose. And let me give you just among many, many words, seven words that I felt would be words that would uh, bless others. So here they are. Um, Number one, encouraging words. Number two, caring words. Redemptive words. Our words are powerful. How do we use them to encourage, to care, to speak redemption into the lives of others in the world that is broken? Here's here's another way we can use words to bless. Positive words. Positive words. 
Number five, healing words. Maybe today in your life, there needs to be a word of healing exchange between you and someone else. You want to bless someone? Heal by means of the right word at the right time. Healing words. And number six, timely words. There's a time to speak and a time to be silent. And sometimes God says, now is the right time to say it. Timely words. And number seven, life-giving words. Let's be a church. Let's be people individually that practice giving life through the things that we say. Is that always easy? Is that automatic? No. But in our words, in our life, we we have the opportunity to bless others by life-giving words. Let me tell you, everyone needs them. Especially in this year. People, as I've said many times, are tired and uncertain and what's next. And life-giving words, positive words, caring words go a long ways always, but especially in the times in which we find ourselves. I'll tell you this, and it's true. Building up people with words is far more noble than tearing people down. How you use in your life. How will you use your words? It's far better to lift up than it is to push down. The right word spoken in the right way at the right time can do wonders. It really can. I want you to think about this in your own life. Think about someone that has come alongside you and spoken grace. You ever had someone do that in your life? You needed a timely word and they came alongside and they spoke grace into your life. Or think about it this way. Think about someone that has come alongside you and they have spoken kindness into your life. Makes a difference, doesn't it? Or someone that has spoken truth into your life. The right word at the right time, spoken in the right way, can make an impact on others. And we are to use our words in these ways to bless others instead of to blast them. Now here's something that I think we would all agree on. We have a lot of disunity in our world, but here's something maybe we can all agree on. That um, an encouraging word from someone can carry us for a day or for weeks or maybe even for years. Now, I can't get into your head. I don't know every experience that you've had, but if you've had somebody that has spoken something into your life that was encouraging and positive and redemptive in your life, you can live on that for more than an hour. That will push you forward saying, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. There's hope in life. There's light in the, uh, the middle of uh, a world that seems chaotic. So words count. They're powerful. Would you mark down, if you're taking notes, this uh, great verse Alongside James chapter 3, we're trying to add in Psalms and other verses that talk about the power of the tongue. And here's a classic from Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Note it, if you will, and whatever you do, whatever you do, little or big, whatever you do, whether in word, catch that, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever we do, in word or deed, do it unto His name and His glory and His fame. The power, church, the power of words. And we're learning that as we open this book and we think on it as we understand Scripture and lift that out off the page. We think about it now, but you know what? The application is to come. The application is this week, this day, to think and register our words. Do I use my word, small as it is, in a powerful way to bless others? And I'm telling you, we do that as individuals or as churches We make an impact for the gospel. So James in his practical teaching, five chapters, 105 verses, in this little book near the end of the New Testament, one thing he says in every chapter is something about words. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, you'll find something about words. 
how we speak, what we say, how we pray. All these things are found in this little book, but we learn the power of words. So are are you with me? If you are, say the word power. Well, that's pretty good. Guess what? There's only two points today, so you're, you're halfway done. You talk about a power message, here we go. But let's flip this around, and not only the power positively of speaking um, words that bless, but James gets into the weeds, if you will, and he begins to dive into things that are more than just uh, illustrations. He begins to talk about the problems that are associated with words. There are some things that happen when we speak, and sometimes they are problematic. They harm others. So he begins to talk about, in verses 6, 7, 8, and following, he begins to talk about how words can sometimes get out of control. Been there, done that, haven't you? Sometimes they can be inconsistent, and sometimes our words can be even poisonous as others hear them. So look at verse 6 as James really, he starts to grind on us here and he says, okay, let's talk about words. He says the tongue can be used and it's a restless evil, it's a deadly poison. It begins to talk about how the tongue is also a fire of a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. He's not short on words, is he? He, He's just straightforward. He's saying the things we say can cause tremendous problems, and we know that to be true. He says, understand that the tongue can be contradictory. We can be hypocritical, inconsistent, and the tongue can be our undoing. Verse 7 says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human can tame the tongue. Wow. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Those words haunted me this week as I read this. This should not be. This isn't the way to use your words. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I want to tell you something. Come on in close. This disturbs me. When I look in the mirror, honestly, this has got my name on it. Does it have your name on it? That we could talk out of both sides of our mouth? That we could praise God and that we could curse someone in the next breath. He's talking here about consistency and one minute, as I said, we praise God. The other minute, we can profane people that God has made. We can take the Lord's Supper on Sunday and yet on Monday undo all of that for the things that Christ stands for by our words. It's interesting that my words and your words, we can say, God bless you. And we also can say, I hate you. Same mouth, same person. The way that we speak matters. It counts. And problems come when we speak in a wrong way, a carnal way, when our mouth, our life is not controlled by the Spirit of God living in us. And that new life that we know is possible, then we become pretty human. (laughs) pretty earthly, pretty open to problems caused by our words. Words affect all of life. Just mark it down, mark it down big. Words affect all of life. 
whether it's between you and your spouse, you and your kids, you and your neighbors, you and your coworkers, you and the person that you've known for years or that you just met. Words do a lot of work in our life and they're a big part of our every day. And they matter. They can cause us trouble, as I've been saying, and on a windswept hill in old England, there is a tombstone that you have to look really, really carefully at to read the inscription because the weather has kind of caused it to fade. But if you read carefully, you can find these words, beneath this stone, a lump of clay lies Arabella Young, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. It's a delayed effect. (laughs) Isabella, Arabella, Arabella had a little trouble with her tongue. And it was noted. John Calvin says it this way, there's nothing more slippery or loose than the tongue. Mother Teresa says, words which do not give the light of Christ increase the darkness. Maybe you've heard the story. I've used it before. I like it. Judy's not very fond of me telling this story too often. She says, oh, you're telling the monk story again. Well, Judy, on the first row today, I'm telling the monk story again. Now, maybe you heard the story about a man that was fed up with life, just fed up, so he said, I'm going to get away from it all, and I'm going to join the monastery, and um, I'm going to become a monk, and I'll just get away from life, and I'm going to join the monastery, and so that's exactly what he did. He showed up and signed up and took a vow of silence, and they said, well, you're going to have to go out here, and you can't say anything for five years. And so he did his thing as a new monk, and for five years he uh, served and helped and did all those things. And at the end of five years, they brought him in. His supervisor said, okay, five years down, now you have an audience and you can say two words. And so he thought for a moment and he said, bed hard. (laughs) Well, he went back out for another five-year term of service and did his thing as a monk and served well and quietly and didn't, didn't say anything over the five years. And at year 10, they brought him in and, okay, you know the drill now. Two more words after 10 years. What are your next two words? And he said, well, food bad. Bed hard, food bad. So he went out and took on five more years. And at the end of his 15th year, he was brought into an audience And he was able to say two words, and he said it this way. He said, I quit. (laughs) And the abbot said, I'm not surprised. You've done nothing but complain ever since you got here. (laughs) Words. Positive, yes, but also our undoing. We can be known for being negative with our words. And causing problems with others. So we gave seven words of blessing. Hope you got those. I want to give you seven words that destroy. These are ways that we can destroy by means of the words we use. So let's just say it this way. Number one, hateful words. Number two, critical words. Careless words, words that destroy, hateful, critical, careless, angry. There's number four. Angry words can do damage. Let's fill it out. Slanderous words. Six is profane words. And number seven is words of complaining. Now we could choose a lot more words that do damage, but there is just a handful of words 
hateful, critical, careless, angry, slanderous, profane, complaining words. And if you practice that, live that way, you will undo, you will damage, you will break people and things around you. James is saying, watch your words. It's a small spark, but it can create a large fire. Guard your mouth. Don't be problematic with your words. Now, let's just turn real practical because James, after all, this book is, uh, is practical. I think that's one of the reasons we like it. I mean, I love Romans, which is deep theology and some of the best, deepest words about sin and atonement and salvation and the work of Christ and being part of his family and the victory we have in him and his love that we can never be separated. All that's in Romans and more. But when you turn to James, along with theology, he becomes real practical. Like, here's how it works. Here's where the rubber hits the road. Here, here's where the water hits the wheel. The practical side of it. So let me just say this as we think further today. And uh, you just answer this in your own mind. But has there ever been a time in your life when someone just deeply hurt you by means of words? I know the answer. And we all have the same answer. Because words can sting and words can break and blast. So on the practical side, as we think about words, taming the tongue, has anyone ever broken you down by means of their words? And we'd all say, yeah, I had that experience, or I've had a lot of that in my life. Practical side of it, let me ask you this. Have you ever in your life, has, have you ever put your foot in your mouth? I can't do it if I was younger. I, I, I could probably do it, but you know, that's an awkward position to be in when you try to put your, you know, you can't do it. But we do that all the time. And I've got to tell you, I mean, I'm embarrassed, ashamed. When I think about my life, oh, it's got some good moments in it, but it's got some moments of undoing. And sometimes I have said things that I know have not gone well. And maybe even unknown to me, I know that my words have hurt people. That's a regret. Maybe you can say the same thing, that we know words are powerful and that in our own life there have been times where we wish we could get something back. We said it, right? We said it and then we wish we could pull it back in. But it's too late. It's out there. So we're talking about something that's critical. It's critical in our day as we think about all that goes on around us and in us. How do I speak and when do I speak and when do I not speak? James is saying, watch your tongue. Don't put your foot in your mouth. Don't say something stupid. <laughs> That's a loose translation of what he's saying. But isn't that what he's getting to the point at? He, he's saying your, your words can be poisonous, a deadly evil. He's talking about all of that. And maybe you grew up in the same school that I did, but I had parents that I think had friends. Because have you ever heard this? It's a lesson of our childhood. If you can't say something nice about someone, don't you say anything at all. Did any of you have parents like that? What they were saying is, watch out what you say. And say that which is uplifting. So let's add into James chapter 3, not only the Psalms, not only Colossians, let's build along with many other passages in the Bible some things that talk about our lips, our words, our conversation, the things that we say day by day. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19, there's a good one to write down. Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. And then I've been thinking about this one for several days. Isaiah, you know Isaiah was the prophet, right? Isaiah the royal prophet. And Isaiah said this in his day of calling to ministry, calling to 
be part of what God wanted him to do. In chapter 6, remember those famous words when in the company of the great king, we've sung about the king of kings today. Let me just tell you, Isaiah in chapter 6, he saw a great God. Enormous, vast, holy, above us, perfect. And when he saw God in his perfection, his ways, God being God, he looked at his own life, and in verse 5 of chapter 6, he said, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in a country, a nation of unclean lips. If you ever get too proud or too boastful or think you you got it all together, you don't. And at our best, we need the grace of God on a daily, hourly basis in our life because our life is as filthy rags before God. And we are a people individually and collectively of unclean ways and unclean lips. Our life needs redemption. And the only one that can do that is what? Jesus Christ. He's the only one. So when you look in the mirror or I look in the mirror and we look at our life, we have to say like Isaiah, I'm a person and I'm undone and I'm not clean. And my lips often say things that don't reflect that I know the King of Kings. New Testament book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 Paul in his teaching says, Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Maybe all these writers, Old Testament and New Testament alike, are saying when you think about words, don't use words that are useless or worthless or careless or hollow. Church family, It requires neither courage nor grace to tear other people down. We have to have a tight rein on our tongue. And if we don't, inevitably it will do damage that we will regret and cause pain in the lives of others. So, all that said, let me wind down pull it all together and give just several conclusions that I want to share as we get ready to leave today. Number one, um, how you speak to God, others, and yourself is important. How you speak to God, other people, and yourself is important. And I say it this way, it's important because it will direct your life. You'll set direction in your life by the way that you speak to God, to others, and to yourself. So words are directional. Number two, as you think about putting all this together, the tongue reveals matters of the heart. What we say, it's going to be hard, what we say reveals character it reveals our character it's like they said the old saying that says what's down in the well will come up in the bucket so what's down in here in you inside you comes out it's good or bad but our character is seen by the things and the way and the tone and the use of our words Isn't this practical? (laughs) This is just where we are. Two more. Number three, I want to say it this way. The only way to tame the tongue is to get a brand new heart. The only way to tame your tongue is to get yourself a brand new heart. And that comes by knowing Christ. Christ can change somebody's vocabulary. 
Christ can give someone a brand new life. He transforms the old into the new. So today, we're not coming to the altar, but maybe where you are, maybe online as you're listening today, here's my challenge to you and to me. Give your words to Christ. It's an intentional act, like, Lord, I need you to help me today. I give you the things that I say. Don't let me say things that are out of bounds or not reflective of you. Give your words to Christ and let Christ give a brand new heart. And when you have a brand new heart, a new person, Christ says, I can make you speak in a way that people see grace and love. And they see something in you that's not worldly, but it is of God's kingdom, His work, God in you speaks differently than the rough vocabulary of our day and time. The world is not like that. But if your life, my life, is touched with the flavor and the person of Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in us, then God gives us a new heart to speak in a way that others don't recognize. And it's a positive thing. And then finally... Use your tongue for God's glory. To magnify Christ. I can't think of anything greater than if God gives me the ability to speak. That a big part of my life is I'm going to magnify and give glory to a God that I owe everything to. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Lord, you've got my words. You've got my heart, but you've got my words. And I want to praise you with my words, not only on Sunday, but always. And when our words become an act of worship, the light of Christ living in us shines. Use your words. Whether you have, not being a pessimist here, okay, whether you have a month to live, 10 years to live, or 70 years ahead of you, use your words in some way that when they see you, people around you go, wow, that young man, that young woman, that man, that woman is different. They speak grace, kindness, truth, light, life into others. James is getting at all of this because it's important. So before we pray and sing, I was thinking about this, and it comes out of the little book of 1 John. Do you remember who Jesus is? He's described in 1 John as the word of life. Think about all Jesus did in his earthly ministry. I know this about him. He came and he gave life. Sometimes it was a touch. Sometimes it was a look. And sometimes it was his words. And all those words, many of them recorded right here. Words of life. It's a challenge. Let's bow our hearts and our lives before him today and pray and then we're going to talk about the goodness of God as we sing and close if you are here today or if you're listening online have you made a decision in your life to trust Christ has there been that moment that season in your life where you've turned to him the Bible says if we have Christ we have life if we don't have Christ we have no life I want to encourage you, if you've never trusted Jesus, to be your Savior, to take away sin, to give new life, to give you a brand new direction, that today, right now, in July 2020, this could be the day. Where you are, where you sit, if you've never encountered and said, God, I turn my life over to you, I repent of my ways, and I trust you. Today could be the day. His arms are open. His heart is big. He gave everything so that we might know Him. Knowing God and 
making him known. 